Inga Lotz was found bludgeoned to death in her apartment on March 16, 2005, leading to one of the most controversial unsolved homicide cases in South African history. Inga Lotz was very much loved by her parents, Juan and Juanita. They attempted to have a baby for over 10 years before Juanita finally became pregnant with Inga. Juan was a prominent professor of radiology at the University of Stellenbosch, and Juanita was a physiotherapist. The proud parents didn't have any more children after having Inga. They were so in love with their little girl, she was more than enough. When Inga graduated from high school, she decided to pursue a degree in mathematics in college. An intelligent and responsible young lady, Inga continued to study after completing her bachelor's degree. In 2005, Inga was on her way to obtaining a master's degree in mathematical statistics. The future looked bright for Inga. She was beautiful and could do anything she wanted. Many people admired Inga for her pretty looks and kind personality. Inga also adhered to the teachings of Christianity and lived a life of virtue, kindness, and love. In 2004, Inga met Fred Vanderviver from the Eastern Cape of Africa. Fred grew up on a successful cow and tomato farm. Not only did Fred excel academically, but he was also a strong athlete. He played rugby, cricket, and tennis. Almost immediately after meeting, Fred and Inga started dating, and Inga's parents, Juan and Juanita, adored him. He seemed to be a perfect match for their daughter, and they considered him a member of the family. Fred Vanderviver had just graduated from university and was completing his postgraduate studies. He worked for a prominent investment and insurance company in South Africa and shared an apartment with a friend from work, Marius Bratha. Inga moved out of her parents and into an apartment in Stellenbosch in February 2005. Many units were still under construction in this new apartment complex. She was only a half hour drive from her parents' home in Welgamode, so she still saw them frequently. The relationship between Inga and her mother Juanita was particularly close. Every morning, Inga called her mom and left a missed call to let her know she was safe. When they were not together, Inga's mother Juanita and daughter wanted to ensure they were safe since the violent crime was a problem in South Africa. Whenever Juanita received a missed call from Inga, she usually called back when she had some free time so they could discuss their day. Inga visited Juan and Juanita's house every weekend, bringing flowers for her mother. Religion was at the center of Fred and Inga's relationship. Inga was raised in a Christian household and attended church services with her family, but Fred came from a more conservative church, his people church. The church is against physical contact before marriage. The relationship between Fred and Inga was not intimate, but Fred believed that Inga was still a virgin. Fred stayed at Inga's apartment one Tuesday in March, since it was closer to campus and he had a lecture the next day. That night, Fred congratulated his brother on his pregnancy, but the two brothers got into an argument during the call. The following morning, March 16th, Fred and Inga sat at the table to eat breakfast together and argued. Fred was acting irritable and grumpy, and Inga thought she had done something to upset him. When Inga asked Fred what was bothering him, he said the fight with his brother. However, Inga didn't believe Fred and started to cry. She wondered if he loved her, and Fred said he did, but felt like Inga didn't care about him. Inga told Fred she still loved him. When Fred had to leave her work, he asked Inga to write down her feelings in a letter, and they would discuss it when he got home. At 7.45 a.m., Fred left Inga's apartment for school. While Fred was attending class, Inga wrote him a two-page letter, telling him she was on her way to deliver it when she finished it. She was leaving her house when a contractor arrived. They were there to fix her balcony's broken tiles. When Inga moved into the apartment, 
Her furniture was too large for the front entrance, so they used the patio door and broke some tiles. She told the contractor she was leaving and asked him to return later. When Fred emerged from his lecture hall on campus at 10 a.m., he found Inga waiting. They parted ways after she handed him an envelope containing a letter. Fred went to a furniture store in Stellenbosch after meeting with Inga to pick up a cabinet for his friend. He loaded the cupboard into the back of his vehicle before leaving work. After attending class in Stellenbosch, Inga met her childhood friend for lunch. According to Inga, she felt it was over between her and Fred after their morning fight, which she described as a hell of a fight. The friend suggested she re-examine their relationship to see if it should continue. On his work computer, Fred logged into the online platform of a cell phone provider just after 1 p.m. and sent Inga a text message. It read, Hey, I'm glad your lecture went well, and I hope you enjoyed catching up with Vimpy as well. Over lunch, I read your letter. Thank you very much. I will look at it again tonight when I have more time. I appreciate it. I hope you have a great afternoon too. Love you, my angel. FXX. The last text Fred received from Inga was at 1.36 p.m. It read, Had a great time at lunch. Tiling done. Miss you already. XX. Then Fred stepped into a meeting with at least six other people for the afternoon. Around 3 p.m., Inga bought a burger from a fast food restaurant and headed to the grocery store to purchase a magazine and a drink. Afterward, Inga rented the Stepford Wives from the movie rental shop. After reading some emails, Fred logged back into his computer and left the office around 6 p.m. Then he drove to his own apartment with his roommate, Mary Botha. They ate dinner and watched TV together. Afterward, Fred left with Marius to drop off the kitchen cupboard he picked up that morning from the furniture store for his friend. Fred tried to call her at 9 p.m. and again three minutes later, but she didn't answer. Although this seemed unusual to Fred, given their fight that morning and how things were between him and Inga, he assumed she wasn't interested in talking to him. Even so, he sent another text around 9.40 p.m. asking if she was okay and saying he would call her back if she missed the call. Inga had yet to respond. 20 minutes later, Fred texted Inga's mom, telling her he couldn't reach her. He began to feel uneasy and wondered if her mom had heard from her. She replied that she had yet to hear from her daughter. At 10.08 p.m., Fred called Inga again, but she did not answer. His roommate, Marius, suggested they contact one of his friends who lived closer to Inga. Marius thought that their friend could check on her. As Fred left the house at 10.30 p.m., he told his mother he was picking up spare keys for Inga's complex to check on her welfare. An error made by a subcontractor had caused all the apartments in the complex to have their locks changed the previous day. Around 10.35, Fred and Marius' friend found a dead body in Inga Lott's apartment. He immediately contacted law enforcement and also informed Fred's roommate, Marius. Fred arrived at the Lott's home in Welgamode around the same time. He headed to Stellenbosch after collecting the remote control from Inga's gate. After this, Fred called his mother and told her he was en route to Stellenbosch because something was wrong with Inga. As Fred didn't know what was going on, he asked his parents to pray. When Marius arrived at the Lot's home, Inga's mom was in the driveway and Fred was sitting in his car, which was parked on the side of the road. Fred's actions at this moment would become a significant source of controversy. In Fred's initial statement to police, he said he had turned around at an intersection near Stellenbosch. However, Fred changed his statement and claimed he had turned around at a crossroads not far from Rachel's family's home. He also said that he had walked into the Lot's home to wait for Marius and prayed with Inga's mom, Juanita. According to Inga's mother, the events unfolded differently than Fred's. Juanita attempted to call Fred at 10.50 p.m., but he didn't answer. Fred was sitting in his car, eyes closed, when she stepped outside to wait for Marius. 
A moment later, Marius arrived and informed her that Inga had died before she could ask Fred what he was doing. Family from across the country came to Stellenbosch to support the Lotz and Vanderviver families after Inga's death. Fred slept on the floor of Inga's room. He created a memorial for Inga and lit candles as if her bedroom were a shrine. The Lotz family asked Fred to leave Inga's childhood room after her funeral. A number of Fred's actions in the days leading up to the funeral did not sit well with Inga's parents. Fred discussed Inga's letter earlier that day with Juanita Lotz on the night of her death. When Juanita asked to see it, he gave her another shorter note. Juanita found it strange that Fred wouldn't show her what Inga wrote. Several officers were in Inga's apartment the night of the murder, trampling all over it. When forensic technicians arrived, they bagged what evidence they could. Since the community was outraged, the police were under a lot of pressure to solve Inga's brutal murder. Inga Lotz's murder was one of South African history's most notorious botched investigations. In recent years, the police have been accused of losing, compromising, and fabricating evidence. It was clear from the crime scene that there had been no struggle during Inga's murder. She was still sitting up with her legs crossed and a magazine on her lap. She was reading an article about one of her friends who was a competitor in a beauty competition. Inga suffered several blows to the head and one to the hand while defending herself. Also, she had stab wounds on her neck and chest caused by a sharp object. Her stab wounds were inflicted after she had passed away. As a result, Inga Lotz suffered over 50 stab wounds. Neither the keys to her car nor her cell phone was stolen. They were in the kitchen, indicating that this was not a burglary. There was only a kitchen knife missing and a remote control for the gate of the security complex that was used to enter and exit the complex. There was a DVD from the video rental shop on the coffee table in front of the couch. Police lifted some fingerprints, most of which remained unidentified. According to Inga's autopsy, she was not raped. An examination of her head wounds concluded that the murder weapon was a blunt object, such as a hammer. From the start of the investigation, police believed that Inga knew the perpetrator. The only way anyone could have entered her apartment was if she had let them in. She was also dressed in shorts and a tank top, and being rather conservative, Inga would not have felt at ease in front of someone dressed in revealing clothes. It must have been someone she felt comfortable with. Moreover, the violence was personal. It was viewed as a crime of passion committed by someone angry with Inga at the time. After the brutal attack, the perpetrator went into the bathroom and cleaned up. A bloody towel was found on the bathroom floor next to two blood marks. The marks looked like they could be a partial shoe print, but there were no other bloody shoe prints anywhere else in the apartment or leading away from it. Police had eliminated Marius Botha, Fred Vanderviver's flatmate, as a suspect. They were investigating the suspect as someone with unexpressed love for Inga. On Inga's coffee table was a DVD cover with a print identical to that of Fred Vanderviver, who claimed to be at work when she took the DVD out of the store at 3.07 p.m. Two weeks after the attack, a 17-year-old known criminal and meth addict named Werner Carolus confessed to killing Inga. Carolus claimed that he had killed a woman who got drugs from him on weekend nights. A few months later, he admitted to witnessing Inga's murder. The police took Carolus to her neighborhood after his friends fled. As he looked through the window, he saw Inga lying on the couch, bleeding from the arm. The police took Carolus there. He eventually retracted his confession and claimed that he had made it up. Carolus pointed out Shiraz, the apartment complex where Inga lived, but was unable to identify her apartment. When investigators searched Fred's apartment, they found a shoe matching the bloody mark on the bathroom floor at Inga's apartment. Inga's parents gave Fred an ornamental hammer slash bottle opener for Christmas after asking Fred if he owned a hammer. Fred Vanderviver, the boyfriend of Inga Lotz, was poised to be arrested two months after she was murdered. 
Two years after Inga's murder, the trial against Fred Vanderviver kicked off in the Cape High Court. To honor Inga, her mother, Juanita Lotz, wore bright scarves when she went to court. The fingerprint on the DVD cover placed Fred at the crime scene after 3 p.m., proving his presence at the crime scene. However, the police returned the DVD cover to the store where Inga rented the movie, losing vital evidence. Fred's accusers believed that he knew Inga was dead and never intended to check on her. His supporters argued that he was in shock. There was also the shoe print evidence. A defense expert testified that the blood mark in the bathroom was not Fred's shoe print. He said it wasn't a shoe print at all. The expert claimed it was a blood transfer mark from a bloody object being placed on the floor. Fred Vanderviver, accused of killing Inga Lotz in November 2007, cannot be charged with the crime again. Investigators hired by the Vanderviver family pointed the finger at Inga's uncle, Ian Myberg, Juanita's brother. They believed he had killed Inga based on Myberg's ex-girlfriend, who said that he had phoned her at 9 p.m. on the night of the murder to tell her that Inga had died when Inga's body was only discovered later. Cell phone records contradicted her statement. There was a rumor circulating that Inga wasn't Juan's daughter, but Juanita's brother, Ian Myberg's. These rumors were unfounded. Following Inga's parents' $80,000 reward offer in March 2012, interest in the murder case flared up again. But still, no new leads came in. Fred Vanderviver completed his studies, and he married. Inga Lotz's murder is still unsolved. So what do you think about the murder of Inga Lotz? Was Fred Vanderviver the one responsible for her brutal death? Or was it her uncle, like Fred's defense alleges? What case would you like to see covered next? And don't forget to hit the bell icon and subscribe.